NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Hello, everyone, and a very pleasant evening to you wherever you may be. I am Brian White from JPL's Office of Communications and Education, and welcome to our final remote edition of the 2020 Von Karman Lecture Series. Our series will return in January of 2021, but it's been quite a year, and I wanted to take a moment to thank all of you joining us from all over the world for this series. As we've gone from our public on-lab lectures to these remote editions, your patience and curiosity fueled us to find ways to continue to connect with you our audience. As we say every single week, every single month, this is your space program. Over the past 11 months, we've said farewell to Spitzer. We've looked to Earth, explored how to become an engineer. And tonight, we talk about the lessons of failure. Ever try? Ever fail? Try again. Fail again. Fail better. I think we could all relate to Samuel Beckett after this year. Joining us as co-host this evening is my colleague, Nikki Wyrick. Hiya, Nikki. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me tonight. I am very excited to be here, and I'm excited to take questions from all of you watching tonight. We want to make sure that you stay involved with our conversation this evening. So if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook Live, make sure you ask questions in the chat box, and our diligent social media team will bring in as many as they can to our talk tonight. If you don't see the chat box, make sure you reload. And as always, we want to remind you that this is your space program. So thanks for being involved tonight. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks for joining us. Uh, as always, folks, if we run into any technical difficulty or small little failures, uh, we ask your patience and stick with us. We'll get them sorted out as soon as we can. Now, our speaker tonight discussing this wonderful topic is Chief Engineer for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, as well as Chief Engineer for JPL's Engineering and Science Directorate. And I'm not going to go through all of the missions he's worked on because we'd be here all day and we will be discussing quite a few of them throughout the evening. But as an engineering fellow, he has been designing, testing, and operating robotics, robotic spacecraft for nearly 40 years, including Galileo, Cassini, Magellan, and many Mars missions. Most recently, Rob helped create a team to design and build an emergency use ventilator specifically for the COVID-19 pandemic. Of all of his accolades, and there are many, my favorite is that he has a minor planet named after him. Please welcome Rob Manning. Hi, Rob. <laughs> hey, Brian, thank you. What a great intro. I always like, who is that person you're talking about? Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Brian and Nikki. It's so great to be here, and it's so great to talk to everybody. This is a real treat. Well, thank, of course. Thank you for being with us tonight, um, particularly on this topic. Uh, we just said your resume is exemplary. You've gotten to work uh, on so many missions. Uh, but I want to know, particularly for our students watching tonight, how did you originally get to JPL? Ah, oh, great question. Well, I was very lucky. I, I was, I was a, you know, in fact, luck plays a role for all of our lives, of course, but. But I was very lucky in that I was a student at Caltech, which is just a few miles down the street from uh, from JPL. And I was and they were looking in the early 80s. They were looking not for engineers because they had plenty of them in, that, in those days. They wanted some technicians. And I said, hey, I, I'm willing to take anything. Just, my, just get my foot in the door. So I found myself as really literally as a draftsman sitting on a drafting table with big plastic, plastic vellum uh, sheets of uh, schematics where I was drawing with a number two pencil and a nice, wonderful electric spinning eraser and drawing and erasing my mistakes uh, uh, in, the, in, these, in these electronic circuits that were going to be uh, d d electronics that were going to ultimately fly on a mission called Galileo to, to Jupiter in a few years. Uh well, I want to bring up image number one because we've got a great shot of JPL uh, and also you, uh, and you're you're letting somebody sit on a, a model of a rover. Who is that? Ah, I know that that, that uh, well that it's actually a little robot that we put inside large, smaller robots. This is where we get our autonomy. We put small people inside small rovers. <laughs> you probably thought you probably knew that. This is the trick behind all of our autonomous systems. But no, this is my daughter, Colleen Manning, and she's she when she was very young, I took her into the, to our sandbox uh, where we were, had been testing 
the, the Curiosity rover and, and uh, Little Sojourner rover, the very first Mars rover to explore the surface of another planet. Uh, and uh, and I, I couldn't resist putting her, this is just a model uh, of the rover, but I, I couldn't resist sitting her there. She was so light and uh, uh, she'll, she'll, uh, it was just a very, it was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was, we had such an amazing experience, very much like the Ventilator experience, where a small team of people did amazing things to make something happen. Uh, where we really try to dare mighty things on Mars Pathfinder. It was quite an experience. Well, we'll be bringing that phrase up again. Um, and before we get into these examples, why is this, I mean, this topic is important for me. I know a lot of people it is. Why do you think this is important for not only our audience, but anybody walking down the street? Well, this is, uh, this is a great question, uh, uh, Brian. I, I, one, of my, one of the things, well, first of all, I, I, this is a talk that, I, this is derived from a talk I give to my to engineers and not just engineers, but all of our staff at JPL uh, to try to, to remind them that 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 this is a very humanistic effort that we do. We try to do very hard things. I said earlier, trying to dare mighty things. This is one of our mantras. This is not just JPL. It's all of NASA. We try to we try to we, we're, we're we're working at the behest of all of you taxpayers out there. Thank you very much. But we're, our goal is to try to be to try to go out there and try to not just do something new and for the first time for its own sake, but try to do something for for great reasons so that we can push both the human and, and, and scientific understanding of our world and our universe. Um, but, you know, in the process, though, there, I see a lot of people, including ourselves, our own engineers and scientists, um, um, being really hard on ourselves. It's it's interesting. Um, in fact, this, this seems to be our whole culture right now. I'm sure all of you uh, can comment on it. Uh, well, is that is, is one of a lot of criticism and, and, and a lot of a lot of criticism. We, we're really hard on ourselves. And I and I really I see that uh, that our expectations for all of us seem to be so high. And yet we're always disappointed and people seem to be so disappointed when we turn out to be just normal mortals, all of us. And it's not talking about engineers and scientists, but everybody. We, we put the bar very, very high, which is, you know, it's just good. But we have to understand our own humility and, and, and humanity, that we are not perfect human beings and that we as human beings need to learn. And one of the wonderful things about engineering, it's built on the idea of trial and error, that you can make mistakes, try something and build it again, see if you can get it, because no one is perfect. No matter how smart you think you are or how smart you would love to be, you have to understand that we do make mistakes and we have to create an environment where mistakes can be made before everybody's watching you on CNN. <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of good to bring us up to our first um talking point today. Uh, there was a time before people walked on the moon and JPL had a big part of, of that, um, those proof of concept early on missions. And we're discussing oh, yeah. the Ranger missions. Now these proof of concept oh, yeah. robotic missions, what were some of the first lessons that we learned from those? And we'll bring up our next image on that too. Okay. Well, so, so the Rangers are really cool. And, and it's funny, I like talking about it because it's so long ago, people have actually for, oops, sorry, forgotten what, what actually happened. And the, so, the, so JPL was very lucky to be in the right place at the right time and, and, and was able to build uh, the very first American satellite that was put into outer space as part of Explorer program. That was, that was in the very late 50s. But, but, but uh, fortunately, our, the director of JPL said, we wanted to, we don't, you know, we'd love to get you, all of us, you NASA, you can work on, you can work on getting people. All we want to do is kind of make robots and, and explore the scientific element, and we, you can while you're doing humans, we will send these little robots out there, and and, it, and so NASA says, okay, fine, 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 you can do that. So so we started making these relatively in, to, by today's standards very inexpensive missions, and the and the Ranger program was the first in a series. So Na, but NASA said, listen, you guys, before you go to other planets, what we need to do, we're going to the moon. We want to send astronauts to land on the moon by the but before the decade is out. So early in nineteen sixties, JPL set out to build. Um, a series of missions called the Ranger. What they were, these Ranger spacecraft were intended to aim for the moon. No, no one had been to the moon and, and, or, or even had close-up pictures. So the idea was this spacecraft would be aimed like a bullet to the moon directly and, and it'd have a camera that was pointed down, go click, 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 taking pictures very quick, click, 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 and sent them back as fast as they can up to the point where just before impact, the resolution on the images would expect to be very, very good. 
but it all, but that was a tall order because in those days we didn't have digital cameras. There are video cameras. They're called Viticon tubes. Um, they were, uh, it was, it was really a television set. They're much like the old days, in the 1960s and 50s of, of the big television screens, but made much, much smaller. And, <laughs> and all that had to be put together and work properly. And so JPL had never navigated something that all the, that far across the solar system. They just really had thrown things out there before and hope they weren't trying to aim. But now we were learning how to aim. We were trying to learn how to control something from Earth. And we didn't we really didn't have a lot of control over the joysticking of Earth from, from Earth. Um, it was because even though it was, it was only three seconds away by speed of light, it still required a lot of autonomy on board the vehicle to be able to click through those actions very quickly as it approached the moon. So what happened? Well, it, 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 there, they built a whole bunch of these. JPL built a whole bunch of these. And the first five, over the course of, of about a little over a year from, from late 1961 to late 62, they set five of these missions up one at a time every few months. And every single one of them failed. In fact, the first one was very, you know, would be by today's standards, very embarrassing. While it was sitting there uh, inside the nose cone on the, on the rocket pad, the solar panels, which are buttoned up like this, um, they inadvertently sent a command or, or caused a command to happen where the solar panels went boom and hit the wall of the nose cone. <laughs> so it's like a, almost like a cartoon. Um, the, fortunately, they were able to open, take the nose cone off, climb up on the rocket, restow the solar panels, screw them back in, and then launch it. Well, fortunately, that was the good news. But the bad news, as soon as it went up there, it had all sorts of problems and it didn't make it to the moon. That was number one. This Other problems happened on number two. Other problems happen number three. Other problems number four. I have a, and another set of problems in number five. And the last one just, just kind of, they keep missing the moon. In some cases, they hit the moon, went around the back and bumped into the wrong part of the moon. Of course, on the backside of the moon, you can't send back to Earth. So it's a, it was a series of, of really um, horrible disasters. And, and after, you know, you can imagine the, the, the lab director um, who, who came along, who, who's, he would, he, every, every few months, he would stand up in front of a wall of TV cameras and reporters and come up to the microphone and say, well, it didn't work again. And uh, up, can you imagine what an institution, well, man, those engineers and, and people who are developing, how they felt, it was absolutely heartbreaking and frustrating because one of the problems is they didn't really understand why it was failing. So after five attempts, NASA says, stop, stop, stop. You're just wasting taxpayers' money. What are you doing? So JPL said, okay, what are we doing wrong here? And so JPL regrouped and rethought this through and said, okay, what would it take to be, what are the things we're doing wrong? So JPL said to, its, to, our, to the, the engineers and project managers and the directors said to themselves, well, what could we do differently? And they realized there was a lot of lessons we can take, even though we don't exactly know why all these things failed, we can take, we can take this much more seriously than we have. So JPL reorganized itself and added things like quality assurance and mission assurance and all, and all sorts of uh, uh, patterns for ownership of design among individuals. Because up to that, it's just a bunch of people working together. As 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 my uh, as my uh, mentor John Cassani told me, you know, people were falling over each other working on the spacecraft at the same time. It just no one was no one knew what they were doing. So now, so JPL reorganized itself, rethought it through, and and uh, and, tr and try to make. Uh, 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 rethink the design. In fact, that's exactly what they did. They stood down for, for a good fraction of a year and reorganized itself. Um, one of the things they did is, I don't know if you, you can see in that picture, there is a, there is a, uh, a, a, uh, a round ball on top. JPL, mm -hmm. it was very audacious. They, they were going to make a lander, a balsa wood lander with a rocket that stopped it in midair, allowed it to crash on the, on the surface of Mars and be able to make some seismic measurements on the surface of the moon. They got rid of that. They simplified, listen, we don't need that anymore. We can just make it, keep it simple, keep it simple, keep it simple. And they did. And they finally, finally, after a year of redesigning the laboratory, redesigning how we we're doing everything from scratch, they finally got it to work. Uh, it turns out that the first attempt they tried after, start, after the start down actually didn't work. It worked, everything worked fine, except by accident, the, uh, while the vehicle launched, the camera took all of its pictures early due to a little bit of a spark in one of the connectors. And so, so another disaster. But fortunately, there are three more successes in a row that, that followed. And you know what? They, JPL breathed this huge sign of relief. Can you imagine? So there were, imagine the, report, the reporters and others are saying, you know, what, you know, who are these idiots? You know, what are they doing? You know, what, what do they do with our taxpayers' money? Why do they think they know what they're doing? Um, and you know what? 
because we didn't. We had never done this before. We were asking to, we were being asked, and we were audacious enough as an institution to say, yes, we can. Can we? Can we? Yes, we can. Sure, we'll do it. We'll learn. Well, the trouble with this system, we couldn't learn. We, we didn't know why they failed. So we worked hard to figure this out and, and, and made a, make sure we understood what was going on and try to understand why it worked and why it wouldn't work. And, and we took this to heart and, we, and we, we, were, we started the process of saying, listen, if we're gonna fail, let's understand why we fail and not be afraid to stare failure directly in the face and learn and learn from these mistakes. So Ranger really was the first step in establishing a culture of learning from these moments. But something else that you said was talking about taking ownership. Yes. Um, and that's something I think we're, we're going to talk about throughout all these different missions that we're going to talk about, but taking ownership of, of the mission, of the goal, rather than just saying, do it this way, this way, and this way. And you, you've talked yeah, to me yeah. about the differences yes. between that. Well, you know, it, we, you know, it's, you know, I, I, I'm a parent. And so uh, um, one of the things that that's, that's so easy to do as a parent, in fact, not just parents, all of us, we're, it's, we're just wired to do it, is to tell people how to do their job. You tell them, do this. Okay, no, now move your, move your mouse more to the right, then click. No, no, not now, click again. And, and so, so people, people uh, we're really, really tempted to want to give people, uh, you know, do the fishing for them rather than teaching them how to fish and t be, take ownership to become a fisher person. And so, so, uh, so, uh, so the idea of ownership is to give people the objective. Sure, show them how you do it. So show them how it's done. They can watch it, they can practice it, but then give them the space to figure out really how to get it done for the situation that they're in. And that's called, for us, that's called ownership and aligning uh, a, a group of people along a, a, a mission objective. And, and you, you could do that, not just at a top level in terms of where, yes, we're gonna send a mission to Mars. And it's gonna drive, drive around another, another planet. But each piece can be done the same way. You can take each piece and say, listen, what is your mission? Well, my mission is to make a mobility system that can walk, drive over these complicated rocky and, uh, slopes in the surface of another planet. And so you take that as a mission as opposed to a series of tasks. Now you're more likely to take ownership with the outcome and, be, and, and, and own the fact that yes, my job is to make that happen. Yes, my job is to actually see it through. And so that's, that is something that um, many of us, in fact, it's a, it's a very common belief that we have at JPL, that ownership is a key function of how you get something accomplished. So NASA JPL, we're starting to take ownership. We're learning from these early lessons. We have, we have some successes uh, and we're able to start daring mightier and mightier things. And the more we dare, the higher the risk of failure. And I wanna yes. go to our next image and let's talk about the yeah. Mars Climate Orbiter. Yes. Um, well, th that's a great mission. Um, I, 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 I mean, it was, it's a great example. I mean, I, to be honest with you, it's actually part, it was part of two missions. There were two missions. I, I, you know, um, I had mentioned Mars Pathfinder earlier, but Mass Mars Pathfinder was one of the first of a series of what was called at the time, faster, better, cheaper missions, where the idea mm -hmm. is to reduce the cost, reduce the overhead, try to be lean and mean, and try to do as much as you can with the smallest team you possibly can. Well, here, a wonderful team of very talented people, mind you, were designing two missions, an orbiter and a lander at the same time. And they were trying to capitalize on the simulators in those designs and put them together. Um, in the process, this, the, 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 they were both launched in the same launch window. Remember, you can only go to Mars every 26 months because you have to wait for the line. You can actually, you can leave Earth orbit anytime you want to get to Mars orbit. But if you do it, if you leave it uh, anytime you want, chances are Mars won't be there when you get there. So you have to time your departure so that Mars will be there when you get there. And so that means every 26 months you can go. And that's the launch window is only a few weeks long. These two vehicles are on their way. This one was, was ahead of the lander. And this is called Mars Climate Orbit. It was a wonderful mission. It was actually itself um, uh, a, a, a mission to kind of help make up for uh, some, some missions, so, uh, another failure that had happened, happened even earlier. But what, so, so this is what's interesting. I, this is what I love about this is when I talk to young people, I said, I said, listen, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be a rocket scientist. You can just look at this. You can look at this picture and says, what's about this? So imagine you're flying this thing from Earth to Mars. 
And you're yeah. and those those are solar panels you see um, sticking on the left there. It's on on, it's on my right hand. Actually, yeah. yeah, there we go. Um, I think we have, you, yeah. you see it there. Okay, so look at that picture. So what do you see? Yeah. It's asymmetric, isn't it? So what what do you see? You see uh, that is that is a, a a solar panel on one side. There's a big antenna that's that, that's that circular thing up on a boom points back to Earth. Um, it's it's a very uh, it's a nice compact design. It's very elegant. Um, but this asymmetric. So what does that mean? It means that if you're facing the sun, what does the sun do? The sun puts out light and shines on your vehicle. Well, light is like like any other photons of light have have momentum. When they hit the solar panels, they cause the solar panels to to be a, a very tiny little force. That force just ever so slightly pushes the spacecraft to one side. So no problem. You just have to round it back again, right? Fire your thrusters on the vehicle, or or, or speed up a reaction wheel or one of the two, to get the vehicle to straighten out. But eventually you have to keep firing the thrusters to keep them, keep the vehicle pointing the right way. Well, no problem. They were plan this was planned for, this was expected. We there's nothing surprising about that. But these thrusters, in the process of doing what they were doing, not only rotate the vehicle, but ever so slightly gave the vehicle the tiniest little push to the left. If you just move, 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 just to the left. And, and so, but it's a very tiny amount. And, and this would happen every few days. Over time, it's the equivalent of force of, of, of literally, imagine a, a toilet paper square on your hand, pushing you, pushing you to the left ever so slightly, every day, every, all the time, just slightly pushing you. Where over the course of months, it turns out that small amount of force will push your beagle to the left. Well, we're not stupid. We know those kinds of things could happen. So we just have to estimate how much that force is. So what we did, we had the software on board, the vehicle, tell software on the ground how much those thrusters were firing and how much it was pushing it. And we would then transfer that information to the navigation team, which would then figure out how much the vehicles moved. Well, well, why do they need that? Why don't they just look at it? Well, this is another little detail. This is something that um, I try to encourage all of my friends at JPL, especially the new people at JPL, to, they, they all should know, how do you know where your spacecraft, spacecraft are in outer space? This is a great question. You know, how, how do you know? I mean, it goes way out there. You can't see it. You know, telescopes, you look out there, you just can't, it's not like a little dot, right? It's just, you can't even see it. No dot. It's too small to be a dot. Um, and so the vehicle's awake and ask what the vehicle knows. Well, how does the vehicle know? It looks back on Earth. It sees another little dot. Maybe a little Mars. Maybe it can kind of figure it out, but it doesn't have these vehicles. This one didn't, couldn't have cameras to see where it is. No, the mm -hmm. trick that we've used, we've used the radio. So what we do, we have a we get transmitters on Earth, and we send a little a little beep, boop, the boop, the beep goes across space, bounces off the radio and antenna and the radio inside, and bounces back to Earth, and we time it, and you know the speed of light because radio waves move at the speed of light, right? Everyone knows that. Mm -hmm. Click. Okay, now we know the speed. Of, now we know how far away it is. Yes. Oh, and by the way, I can also send a tone to the spacecraft and it can bounce the tone back. If the tone is getting, is higher when it comes back, it means it's coming toward you. If it's lower, it's going away. You can tell how fast it is. So those two pieces of information should really help you figure out where your spacecraft is, right? Except for one yeah. detail. It, you're right, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it, except, except that you, you, you know how far it is, but you don't know if it's over there or over there or over there because the radio beams we're sending back are really big. And so it's like, huh. I want, but that's okay. We can figure out where it is because we've been counting how much it's been moving to the left because we've been getting this data. Well, the, um, what happened as the vehicle approached Mars, we discovered, and this is, I think there's another picture um, yeah, coming uh, up. Yeah, image five here, actually. Yeah. Um, so as, as we're approaching Mars, this vehicle is approaching Mars, unbeknownst to us, we had missed, underestimated the amount that space cool had moved to the left. And in the wrong direction, the left. And there's a, so you can imagine this, you, you're coming in from the lower right of your picture there. And the, as the vehicle's coming in, it's being pushed to the left closer toward Mars, but you can't see it from Earth, right? What's hap and what happened was as, as the vehicle came around, got to the planet, uh, planet Mars, it fired its engines just before it got there. We can see the engines fire. And then it disappeared be behind Mars early, early. I thought, whoa, 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 who moved Mars? Mars wasn't supposed to be there. Mars, we're supposed to have plenty of time. We know where our spacecraft is. Mars, what's, what's, going, what's going on? And so we're like very nervous about that. 
Um, so, but unfortunately, some minutes later, we're expecting it to come around the back in this nice little, nice little loop you see here to put itself in a nice elliptical shaped orbit um, because the engines put yourself in the orbit. Otherwise, we've just gone straight. So, mm -hmm. we, we were, turns out, we, we, we actually hit the top of atmosphere. This, at, this lander, I mean, this orbiter became a lander by mistake. It hit the top of the atmosphere and broke up. What happened? Well, within a day, we found within a day or two, we figured out that 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 the 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 forces we were estimating from this from the spacecraft were in the units of pounds, English units of pounds, which is very common for propulsion people because because they use uh, English units for for plumbing. You know, you get a, a one inch pipe, right? Quarter inch pipe, one pound thruster. Um, so so, but but we but, but our navigators do everything in in metric. And so we expected these, this team expected to be metric, and so did everyone else. Because, but of a very tiny little mistake that they, it wasn't corrected properly, and and the, and, the, and we were off by the difference between pounds and the metric version, which is newtons, a factor of four and a half. That's that's huge. We underestimated the force. We were a hundred kilometers off course and in the wrong direction. And this, this again, this orbiter became a lander. It was very embarrass embarrassing. It was, it was very big news. Um, we were shocked, all of us, that we, that, how could we make something so stupid? I mean, it seems like a stupid mistake, right? But then you start thinking about, you know, you start, what is, what's with this mistake? What, how do we make mistakes like this? Well, it wasn't, turns out, that's a, we make those kind of mistakes all the time. It's a miscommunication, those kinds of things. It, it's not that we made the mistake that was wrong. It was that we didn't, catch it because all of us make thousands and thousands of mistakes all human beings that's what humans do including the best engineers and scientists of the world we we're all human we're all fallible and so the trick is how do you do something how do you make something a billion dollar mission say land a big billion dollar rover on the surface of mars where thousands of things have to work right how is that possible? Did you just hire a bunch of great people? No, no, you don't just hire great people. You hire good people the best you can, but you can't expect being good to be good enough. And so what you need to do is test, 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 check, find out before it's too late. Ask the questions. How do we really know that this is working? What if it doesn't work? Do we, do we care? We really didn't ask those kinds of questions. And I felt, you know, I, people like me really were very naive about this. And so um, uh, I remember those, those days terribly. We were very hard, by the way, talk about being hard on each other. We were very hard on each other. Um, we were, you know, at first people like, because can you imagine the emotional attachment of spending years trying to get these things to work? But, you know, we, we learned. And guess what? We figured out how to do this better. And ever since we have come up with new tricks, uh, we've come up with new tricks that we've used and we'll be using again, coming up here in January when Mars 2020, the Perseverance rover arrives at Mars. We're gonna use new tricks and the new tricks allow us to see where our vehicle is in the plane of the sky. Rather than, rather than just guessing where it is over there, we can now see where it is exactly because we're gonna measure with our radio the angles between that and nearby quasars that have been tracked in the sky. So, so that's how we do it. And it's a new trick, and we've been—it's been—it's and it's and it's something we've used ever since. It was—it had been invented before this mission, but we hadn't really put it to use in all of our missions. And it's—it was just a wonderful, wonderful uh, addition. And now it's become uh, just part of our new lessons, and, and we take this forward. And uh, and that's how we get ahead. We learn from our mistakes to get ourselves back up on the horse and start again. Well, uh, something you've talked about um, when we've been preparing for this show was talk, I've always appreciated the, the grace and humility which you've talked about. Because you, you mentioned that Jay Leno made a joke about your, oh, I mean, yes. that's that, that can't be easy to deal with. Um, but there's also this idea between, and something you brought up is, even with moments like this, there needs to be authentic confidence. There, needs to be humility versus hubris. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a tough thing because think, think about it, we're hiring. So who are the people we're putting on these jobs? First of all, you have to say whether they're, they're, uh, they were in their elementary school, they were A students. Mm -hmm. they, a lot of my A students, you, you know, you, they, uh, their parents 
uh, thought they were, they were pretty smart and their siblings always would say, uh, I don't, when, when a parent would ask a question and the other siblings would say, I don't know, ask Susie, she knows all the answers. And, and, and then you go, um, so Susie's so like on the spot, like, oh, I, I got it kind of these answers. All of us are in the same boat. We all try to, we all try to know, but, uh, and it's important, by the way, you can't be afraid of everything. You can't be afraid of your shadow. You've got to be able to willing to, to get up in, in the morning, I mean, which is probably the hardest part of anybody's day, right? It's just waking up and getting out of bed, right? But then once you get going, get your, get the energy going, see if you can make something happen, but don't be, don't let that confidence that, 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 uh, become that, 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 that wonderful excitement of, of being successful, turn into hubris and overconfidence. And that's, that's the balancing act that we do. And, 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 and it's important. I mean, so I have, this is one of the reasons I have to talk at JPL because, because, because I, we see it, but, but, but even though, even though these people, it's so easy for us to be hard on each other and not just, and I don't mean at JPL at NASA and together, but just in general, um, we, all have to give you space. Because imagine, you know, for kids, especially for kids growing up today, think about this. You know, think about one mistake on a on a social networking uh, is on there permanently. You know, and they so that so they they they, they, they it's like a, it's like the it's like uh, 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 Bob Marley's chains. You know, in around your neck on on uh, on the uh, uh, what's that Christmas show? Um, you remember what I'm talking about. Uh, oh. it's, it's, Robert yeah, it's, it's, I was like, Bob Marley, Robert Marley. Whale, yeah, Robert, Robert Marley, Marley. <laughs> Robert Marley. Yes. Robert. Christmas. It's, Carol, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's not that Bob, Marley, but not, that, <laughs> not the Jamaican one. No. So no, it's, 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 it's these, this issues we have that in the old days, people will forget the mistakes you made. Now these mistakes feel like they have to wear them on their sleeves and they don't want to. And it's something they're afraid of. Uh, and and that's and it's true for all of us. We've got to stop being so hard on each other and give ourselves a chance to to make a mistake, create an environment where mistakes can be caught, um, if possible, and and don't be hard on people just because they make a mistake. Listen, we, we don't need competence either. We don't want everyone to making mistakes and just you know being a, 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 a going crazy. But but we definitely need uh, to to allow people the, the space to 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 fail and be human and learn from those mistakes and try to be better as people because we are not perfect people. None of us are, no one is, we're just people. And so uh, anyway, so that's, that's where that comes. And I, I, and the, I think the comment you made earlier about, you know, it, it was actually the, after the next, the, the, this other failure, Mars Polar Lander, uh, I believe is when uh, Jay Leno, who is some of you may know, was, was remember was a, as a, uh, uh, a nighttime, uh, uh, I had the uh, Tonight Show and he and he you know and I watched him one night and I was and, and trying to trying to get away from my brain away from the stress of work and he said you know well just goes to show you you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be a rocket scientist after our <laughs> after our embarrassing failures and I, and I and I just like this like I read that he's right <laughs> first of all he's yeah. right you don't have to be a rocket scientist but more importantly at that point is is that yeah he's actually making it it sounds it's funny but it is we are human as anybody and that's okay and there's nothing wrong with being a human. And, and so, and I think that's, you know, all of us have to do it. And whether you're a student, where you're trying to learn and you're getting, and you, and you get a bad report card or a bad grade on something, and you know, it's not the end of the world. And, uh, you know, mistakes are part of our very being. I can tell you, I have personally, personally damaged, and I, you know, I'm not proud of this, but I've damaged no less than three Mars spacecraft before they launched. That where they had to be repaired because of me, because I messed up, I screwed up. You know, I, I told us to our HR department, and they went like, "Well, maybe we should have fired you." Yeah, you know, um, you know, that's sort of a <laughs> sort of, we see a trend. Um, but you know, it, it's it, we were daring ninety things. It's hard to get me right, and 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 almost all these mistakes are, are, are things mistakes that I wanted that I share with other people that I that I'm not I'm not. I'm not a, 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 I, I'm not happy that he made those mistakes, but yeah. but the, but I'm willing to share them because it just tells the people that it can happen to any one of us. You, you know, even if the chief engineer of JPL can make a mis dumb mistake, then maybe I can here. But on the other hand, we've got to learn from these mistakes and try to make mistakes before. I don't recommend breaking Flight Harbor, by the way. <laughs> it's very expensive, 
and very time consuming. And uh, so I was very embarrassed and very, uh, you know, it, was, it, what, it, it what didn't, wasn't great. But, but, I, but I do tell people, you know, why not, you know, you're, you're, uh, you know, are you afraid of making mistakes? Are you afraid of being wrong? You can't be afraid of being wrong. That's, I think that's, that's a great uh, segue to our final, or the last mission we're going to talk about tonight is there are okay. lots of questions out there and we want to make sure okay. that everybody, as many of them, we can get as many of those in as possible. Um, I want to go to image seven and it's a, it's a successful mission, um, but curiosity and we want to talk yeah. about the wheels, but really what, what you were talking about, what is the difference between a lesson and a failure and what is a failure of the imagination? Yeah. So, I mean, certainly um, you can, by the way, lessons can be positive as well as negative, but, but, yeah. but, you know, one of the things, and this is something that, you know, almost always if we make a mistake or something, it's because there was something we didn't know. And uh, one, one of the things that I, you know, I try to remind people is, is to, is to keep that humility running and keep that, that new humility knob as high as you can go. Even when you're being challenged to do something that other people aren't being challenged to do. Um, uh, and remember, by the way, is to, to listen to the quiet voices and make sure that the people who don't have, who aren't as verbose as people like me, uh, to the, they can bring their voices to, this, to the table and remind us what the right things are to do. And uh, um, because everybody knows something you don't know. In this case, we've, we, this is a picture of Curiosity Rover's wheels. Now, I am a, I'm a bit partial to Curiosity. I was the chief engineer. I loved, it was a great team and it was a huge challenge for project. Um, we, had, we did make a lot of mistakes, but we fixed them and uh, learned from them. Uh, but one in particular, one that I feel personally responsible for um, is uh, right there in this picture. If you look carefully in that picture, I don't know if you can, folks can see it. Um, there's there's the, that wheel on the right um, this image was taken by a camera at the end of a robotic arm. And so it was able to look underneath the belly and take a picture. And we don't do that very often, but when we did, we looked and said, oh my goodness, what is going on here? Those holes in that wheel, not the, not the kind of the rounded holes, but the one, the holes on the right should not be there. What's going on? It's like somebody poked, poke a hole, poked holes in the wheels. And you know, people like me instantly knew what was going on. And because I seen similar things going wrong in testing we had done before we launched it, years before, back, back, in fact, uh, at least a couple of years and, and, and in, in time, at a time when we, I could have done something about it and fixed it. But what happened was we didn't use our imagination. We didn't, this is a case where, you know, it's hard to be, it's hard to be smart and hard to know Hard to predict the future. Hard to, you know, you know, you know uh, it, 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 predicting the future is very difficult. I forget what uh, Yogi Berra said, a version of that, but it's it is it is very uh, it's very hard. Um, uh, and but but even so, we should have put the all the two and two together. So what had happened was we had seen that the wheels in our test bed, the wheels had been damaged, and so we talked ourselves into thinking, well, well listen, our test program for these wheels was pretty darn good. We had. We had a wheel that was went over these very sharp rocks. I don't know if you know this. So, so where Curiosity landed in a lake bed, um, it's it, it has, it's clays everywhere, and there are rocks sitting in the clay clay bed. And those rocks are sitting there. They're bound hard into this lake bed. And oh, and it turns out if even though there's air is only one percent the density of Earth, it's very very thin. There's wind on Mars. It's not huge, and it, it's kind of, you can barely feel, but it's enough to get little tiny particles of dust to bounce along the surface is called saltation. It bounces over the surface and it can wear these rocks into these incredibly sharp, fine edges, almost like knife edges. They're called ventifacts. That this happens on earth too, but these rocks are basalts, lava rocks. They're really hard. And so, so uh, to, to, but you know, we knew that that happened because we, could, we saw that same thing happen some years back with Spirit when it landed on Mars. We were driving around, I was like, well, look at those sharp rocks. Those are airbag eaters. I told myself, told myself and the team. And so, so we, we were designing this wheel. We want to be sharp, handy, work fine with these rocks. Well, we tested these things on rocks, but guess what? In our test bed, we put the rocks down. We didn't glue them down. We didn't glue them down. And so, and, and there's another thing we did. We did, that's one thing we did wrong. The other thing we did wrong, I might just grab, since I have it here handy, I happen to have a Curiosity Rover uh, model right here. I, have a rover, so, I just happen to have it. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
um, I, I sleep with it at night. It's kind of nice. Uh, so, <laughs> so it's, 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 it's got these, we got these wheels here. And so what happens, so look at this, so these wheels, look at how they move around this mobility system. These, this wheel, these wheels go up and down. Um, they move over rocks. The whole thing moves, but we designed all three wheels to move at the same speed, all three thinking that was the right thing to do. And that works fine for small rovers, but when we scaled up this bigger rover, we weren't really thinking, were we? It turns out, it turns out, if you're trying to drive, what this wheel is trying to drive over a bigger rock, and these wheels, are, these back wheels, are going at, at, at a fixed constant speed, but this wheel isn't, isn't, is going the same speed, this wheel needs to go faster to go over the rock. Well, it, but it wasn't, it was going the same speed. So basically these back wheels are pushing these wheel, the, the front wheel and the side wheels uh, faster than they can keep up. And now if you get these rocks that are buried in clay with sharp edges and sharp and like a like a bear claw you're just going to rip these 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 aluminum wheels like like a like a coca-cola can and that's that's basically what happened uh with us uh and and to to my and my dismay and I, and I was and i was kicking myself for not putting those two pieces together that we really we weren't thinking about we're, we're going to a clay clay we're going to place with water right and that means it's going to be clays. What's clays do? Clays block lock rocks down. What do rock lock rocks do? They make sharp points. They just don't lie there in the ground because when we draw, we were testing the testing the wheels over sharp rocks. These rocks would bend over as the wheels turned over. The rocks the, the points would move with it, and they yeah. weren't damaging the rocks. And so we miss we underestimated just how bad Mars really could be. So we did our imaginations were not sufficient. We didn't put all all the pieces together to allow ourselves to appreciate. What this, what, uh, uh, what could actually uh, arise when we get to Mars, and yet all the ingredients for figuring that out were there two years before we launched. So I, so I, I kicked myself for not put, thinking that through or making a bigger wish out of it. I always appreciate your accountability and your acceptance into these, um, and I, I think that's a that's a big part of of what you have to do, um, but also in everyday life. Um, we're going to open it up to the audience. They've got a lot of questions, so I'm going to send it over to Nikki. How's it looking out there, Nikki? We've got a ton of interest online, Rob, um, especially uh, with our students. I know that's a big passion project of yours. Uh, we've got quite a few people who are asking for advice, how to get jobs at JPL. For instance, Kevin on YouTube has asked, what are your suggestions for early career scientists and engineers wanting to pivot towards getting involved in future space related projects? Oh, well, a little luck doesn't hurt. Okay. <laughs> but I tell you, I think, I think, I think there, I, there is something about people in this line of work that is important. First of all, uh, you're, you're, it's, you're unlikely, unless you start your own company to get rich doing this work. Um, but you will, will be greatly enriched with, with, with the magic of exploration, the magic of trying hard things and being at least attempting to be successful. Um, I think the biggest thing I would recommend for anybody, and they all seem to have this, all the people who come to this, whether it's JPL or NASA, they all share something. And they share a, a deep passion and interest and curiosity in how things work. They want to be part of it. They, they're, they are patient. They're willing to learn. They're, they're not afraid of, of not knowing, uh, at least, at least at first. Uh, and I think, I, I think that, uh, uh, a, 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 a career that starts off where, I mean, obviously for the kind of work we do, it's really hard to get a, take a class on how to build these things and how to do these kinds of missions. However, there is plenty of room to, to, to uh, would really, you can learn that on the job. The hard part is learning the fundamentals, knowing the math, physics, understanding uh, communications theory, understanding uh, thermal dynamics, understanding the, the basics of how how physics works uh, and and the lowest level of engineering works, uh, how electronics works, how computers work fundamentally, uh, not just not just that how the apps work, but what's going on inside these complicated machines that we build, and try to understand those and get try to get an authentic understanding at that lower level. Because because it'll it'll take a lifetime to really learn about all these details about these things. That's okay. You'll learn that on the job. They'll pay you to figure that out. We'll our, we'll pay you to do that. But but we but we really need you to be a person of curiosity and passion and interest with a spark and a willingness to learn and ask questions. 
That's really great to hear. And, you know, some people online have also been asking a little bit more specific questions. For instance, Jeremiah was asking about what type of programs we use and how Jeremiah can learn more about those launch programs or other types of projects. How do we do those calculations and those simulations for those type of things? Oh, I mean, how, how, how do we? Uh, yeah, good question. I, actually, I've wondered that for years. Um, uh, but it's it, the, the wonderful thing about understanding how things work is that once you understand, you can create models of these worlds. You know, for example, the whole the, the incredibly exciting sequence of steps that rec that require that you, that you that, that that the vehicle needs to transform in automatically all by itself on landing day to land these big expensive missions on another planet um, is is almost impossible to test here on this planet. It really is. You can test pieces. I can take. I can go up to one hundred and thirty thousand feet, or, or higher, and, and, and inflate a, a a full scale parachute in front of a rocket and test out the parachute that way. Um, I could. I could. Uh, I can take these wheels and drive them on, a, on an environment that that looks a lot like Mars and do it right. Um, and we do it right now um, and do the testing properly. Um, we, we can we can do almost all these things in bits and pieces, but we can't really test all these things as a system. You can't do entry descent landing, a, a Mars entry descent landing on this planet. Why? Because not just the gravity, but the atmosphere is so much thicker. It's a very different system. Um, on Mars, the atmosphere is, is the equivalent to try to land on a mountain that's a really 130 feet high above the surface. There are no mountains that high. That's many times higher than Mount Everest. And so there's no real way to do it. So instead, we have to build computer simulations and we have to use the laws of physics to, to uh, and inter interacting with models of the atmosphere, of the surface, of, uh, of how, and understanding how, how radar signals come out of a, a radar radios come out of a radar and how it bounces off of rocks and slopes and back into the radar and simulate all of those pieces to try to really get yourself a good understanding of, of whether or not you think this thing's going to work or not. It's very dangerous because, because we can't test it. I mean, imagine this. Imagine the first time you flew an airplane is when you floated up with all the passengers. No, don't do that. Um, um, but we have no choice. So, so we have to have models. We have to have computer simulations. We have to understand the mass properties of a spacecraft in space, its momentum, how much its angular, its angular momentum it has in space so we can fire simulated rockets that push it this way and push it that way so we can aim its, its, uh, its solar panels properly at the sun. And you can do those kinds of things, but it is, it does take, a, it's very tedious work. I'm telling you, this stuff is tedious work. All the, almost all the engineers that come here are very excited. First thing we do is to give them something massively tedious to do because this, because, <laughs> because get, it's so easy to get it wrong. They have to, they have to go through this, 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 this detail to figure out and have the perseverance, which is a key attribute of success in, in, in this business, um, to go through and struggle through it and struggle through it and fight, fight, fight. You know, with so many opportunities and points of failure possibility, it's astounding how much success that you and JPL have had. And Canon on YouTube wants to know, how does it feel to have a mission in which thousands of things can go wrong and have it turn out to be a complete success? How does that feel? Well, it's usually <laughs> a big surprise. <laughs> Every time I tell you, I tell you, so I, I like to tell people all this all the time. And so, you know, you've seen us, you know, uh, there in our, in our, in our, in our uh, uh, polo shirts, you know, or in case of uh, Curiosity Landing was these light blue shirts. And we're all like going screaming up and down. Your faces are turning red, people are crying. It's, it's, are they relieved? No, I mean, are they, are they happy? No, they're not happy, they're relieved. They're, they're, they, it's just like, because, because even up into that very moment, in fact, for me, sometimes for days after, um, you, you are constantly like, what did I forget? What did I miss? What did the, what's the piece of the puzzle that I, that I didn't think of? And so, so but, and that's what we want people to do. We want them to be constantly think about what did we miss? What did I not do right? What mistake did I make? And so, uh, so, so when you put all these pieces together, um, in, in fact, it's really even hard to know as you're getting closer and closer, you think, well, I, am I done? Well, you're never really done until the thing lands. You're constantly thinking about those things. And, um, and that's a good thing. It's a, it's a good thing. You, you sort of know, I have to admit, people, I, people ask me, I said, Rob, how do I know when we're actually done? We seem to be testing and testing and testing. Are we getting done? He says, well, here's a question. Are we learning anything new? If, 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 if we're still testing and we're not learning anything new, and it seems to be doing what we want it to do, 
we might very well be on the plateau. It's very much like you imagine you're climbing Mount Everest, right? You're climbing the mountain, going up higher and higher and higher. And it, but it's but you can't see where the summit is. It's it's all murky and there's clouds everywhere. It, but 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 the slope is sort of leveling off. You're getting up this. It's getting. It was still very steep, but eventually it gets flatter and flatter and flatter. And you go like, but you really can't see if it's, there's another peak ahead of you. But you just say, you know what? I think I might be there. It's we're at the flat spot. We maybe we're at the sweet spot. Maybe we maybe we we're there. But you never know for sure. You know, it's great that we can have these conversations about all this knowledge that you're passing on and all the information that you're learning from your own experience at JPL. And Tio on YouTube wants to know, how does JPL and NASA work to pass on generational knowledge and make sure new employees don't make the same mistakes as their predecessors? Oh, what a great question. I, we have a chief knowledge officer who works works with me and uh, and she is uh, she's chartered with figuring out how do we do that. I tell you, it's really hard because it's a lot of it is stories, storytelling. I mean, a lot of you, and, 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 but a lot of things we do, for example, we, we do because we're engineers, right? OK, well, we learned this lesson. So um, we write down new rules, right? New rules, a whole little rule book that goes longer. It's longer and longer, longer and longer of all the of all the all the things. Well, you know, remember, you can't do this. You got to do this. You can't do this. You got to do this. And, but there was trouble with that style. And we do. And that's something we do a lot is that it, it misses the story, the narrative, that that, and, and and in some sense, the way that we really learn is by living vicariously through the experiences of others, previous generations, standing on shoulders of giants of people who tried and succeeded, and those who tried and failed, and that's and it's really hard to do because guess what? We also have real jobs to do, and we don't have a lot of time. And it's really now in this time, in the time of Zoom and and WebEx and other and and uh, Teams, it's very difficult. To, to, to have those, those, uh, those uh, casual uh, water cooler conversations that allow, that allow people to tell the stories. So this is a really difficult time. And so it's really hard. I, I'm being honest with you, I'm not sure we know how to, answer, how to answer that question. We're still figuring it out. Well, I love that your attitude is that we're still figuring it out. We still get to work together on these things and make yeah. improvements and learn together. Um, Ryu Kachu on YouTube asks us, what's a project that's on the horizon that you're incredibly excited about? Either something right now or something that's not built yet, but it's coming in the future. Oh, we have a bunch of them. It's really exciting. The great thing about being the lab chief engineer, I can see all the things that are going on. What, there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's one mission we're building, which is going to go visit a, uh, a, an asteroid out in the asteroid belt uh, called Psyche. And it, this, is a, this is a rock in outer space that we think was once a planetesimal, a small planet. And something, you know, if you know, most planets have an iron core, right? Well, something we think, we can tell from our telescopes on Earth, we think that, that, that something wiped away all the rock and left this big iron ball, this massive iron ball in the middle of space. And we think that's what it is. We're gonna send a spaceship out there to go visit and confirm that's exactly what that is. Now, if, if that's the case, that's the largest chunk of available iron you would find anywhere in our in our solar system. It's amazing. Um, we have another mission that's going to go to in, in orbit around a, a, around Jupiter. Jupiter, very scary place to fly around. It turns out because it's got radiation from from this. Jupiter has this amazing magnetic field, which is beautiful and that and powerful. But this also got moons that squirt up atoms from volcanoes, Io in particular, and that those 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 particles get accelerated because they're charged up, and they got start racing around around from pole to pole um, in, in around Jupiter, making this a very dangerous place to fly. It's very dangerous for people. It's even more dangerous for people. But you can, if you're lucky, you can make electronics and put them inside vaults of, of lead and send them to Jupiter. But what we're going to do is go to go to orbit and around Jupiter, but not to see Jupiter. We're, we're, we want to go visit and fly by Europa. Europa is this moon. It's a very large moon. It's smaller than our moon, but it's, a, it's, it's un, unlike any other place with possible exception in Enceladus. It, it's, it's, it's a big iceberg, a giant ball of ice, that, but underneath kilometers, many kilometers of ice are these massive oceans. And, and below the oceans is, is a rocky center. So it's like, it's almost like, like, like Antarctica except it's the whole moon. In fact, there's more liquid water on that little moon 
than all of Earth. In fact, maybe three times or more water on that little moon than Earth. In fact, that water could be a very habitable place, could very well be a habitable place for life as we might know it on this planet, where the inside's nice and warm, heated from the tidal forces of Jupiter, and the outside's very cold, but protects the life, the ice protects the life inside from that horrible radiation environment. So that's a very exciting mission. And of course, we get another one. We've got a mission on its way to Mars right this second. Um, Mars 2020 Perseverance rover, I mentioned this before, is on its way June, uh, uh, February 18th, I believe, right? Um, is landing on Mars in the, in the, around, around lunchtime. And, uh, uh, and, and I'm gonna be watching uh, and uh, hope all of you will too. It's a rover, look very much like Curiosity, but unlike Curiosity, this vehicle is going to collect samples pristine samples and put them very carefully in these very specially designed tubes to hold them, seal them tight. And, and, and with, with very, with no trace of human contamination or biological or chemical contamination because of how we're doing it very surgically on the surface of Mars. Once those tubes are collected, another missions, which is just starting now, uh, called Mars Sample Return, is going to land another vehicle it's going, to, it's going to go collect, go send a, a, a rover built by Europe to go collect those sample tubes, bring them back to a rocket made by NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center and launch it into space. And will be then picked up by another system built by NASA's Goddard and, and it's, it's attached to a big European space, space biggest spacecraft ever sent to Mars uh, that will then fly back to Earth and drop off a space capsule that uh, NASA Langley and NASA Ames Research Center have put together and dropped these samples back to uh, back to Earth. And this is the later part of the, this decade, um, in early two, uh, 2030, around 2030. Uh, but that's our hope, and uh, this is what's going on. So incredible excitement, lots of amazing things. And it's just just that's just the tip of an iceberg, too. Well, looks like we've got time for one last question, Nikki. One last question for Rob. So last question of the night, Owen on Facebook asks, loved your book, Rob. Are you planning a sequel about perseverance? Oh, <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I'm glad you like my book. I, but I'm not allowed to advertise it. But I, I tell you, it, it was it is a uh, uh, it was a, it, it's a joy to capture these stories. And I, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to write. I'm not going to write for perseverance. I'm going to leave that to uh, the, the team, the perseverance team uh, to, to tell their stories. And uh uh, but it's it, it, but you know it, 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 capturing these stories is just so essential uh, for our, not not just for the public to see what really goes on behind the scenes, but also to to share with our own staff and the next generation of future space explorers that many of you are, I presume. Thank you for sharing your stories with us tonight, Rob. Sure. Um, that is all the time we have for questions. I want to thank Rob for joining us and discussing this often neglected topic. Um, as a reminder to our audience, we do not have a lecture in December, but we will see you again in January when we discuss spacecraft origami. I'd like to give a huge thank you to everyone on our crew every single person who is involved in these talks for their ingenuity and their drive in keeping these monthly talks going this past year. My final thank you does go out to you, the audience from all over the world. This is your lecture series. We're happy to bring it to you every month. Thank you for, the time for, jo thank you for taking the time to join us. And if you missed one of our talks, uh, you can revisit our Von Karman talks from the past five years they're all on our uh, available on JPL's YouTube page. There's a whole playlist for them, so you can go find them. Before we go, I'd like to pass it over to Rob one last time to uh, give us a reminder of why we shouldn't be so hard on ourselves. Well, Brian, this is great. Nikki, Brian, this is fabulous. Thank you for inviting me. I, I, I have to say, I, I learned one thing from uh, uh, my, my uh, mentor, John Cassani, who told a story about one of JPL's early, the early NASA pioneers named Homer Stewart, um, who said, who said there, you know, remember there's 10 most important words that they, talk, they told each other. One is, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. We can fix it. And so it, 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 it's, it, it, I, I, think, I think those kinds of, those kinds of uh, uh, expressions are very important. I think we need to uh, know that we don't know. And, and by the way, it's not just individuals that we should be not afraid to be, to be honest about our own mistakes, but, we, but our bosses have to also remember to let 
the people who work for them uh, give. The, we need to give them the space to succeed, and all of us need to give us this place to succeed by learning, testing, trying things out, and and before make the mistakes before it's live in front of millions of people on national television. Thank you again for joining us, Rob, and thank you, folks. Stay safe, stay kind, and we'll see you in January. Thank you.